Aha, a Christmas story. It's a holiday classic. Someone you know watches it every year. It's shown 24 hours a day every Christmas. <laughs> Wait, that's not in the film. <laughs> what is that? What's happening? Sorry, Pops, I'm taking over. You are? Yes, give me the mic. <clears throat> Nearly a decade before making A Christmas Story, director Bob Clark churned out another Christmas classic. But it wasn't a light-hearted family comedy. It was a dark-hearted slasher. What makes Black Christmas one of the greatest holiday horror films of all time? Let's find out as we step inside The Colt House. In this episode of The Cult House, I'm going to chronicle the history of Black Christmas and its rise to cult status. Then I'll break down the film's plot before issuing a verdict and giving it a place on the cult rack. Set during Christmas time in Toronto, Black Christmas focuses on a house of sorority sisters plagued by threatening phone calls and a deadly intruder. Screenwriter Roy Moore says he took inspiration from the urban legend of the babysitter and the man upstairs, as well as the ghastly true crime story of a young man's would-be murder spree in Montreal, beginning with the bludgeoning of his own mother. Bob Clark was attached to direct, an American filmmaker who found work in the Canadian film industry. Before Black Christmas, he made the zombie movies Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things and Dead of Night. He would go on to make Porky's and its sequel, the aforementioned Christmas Story, and... Uh, baby geniuses and super babies baby geniuses too a career you could definitely describe as eclectic they shot the film on location in toronto in the winter of 1973 with a talented cast that we'll meet in the breakdown the film premiered in october 1974 in canada before a december release in the states however warner brothers changed the title for its american release to silent night evil night afraid that audiences would mistake black christmas for a black exploitation film which were all the rage at the time but they retracted the title change after its initial release while the film didn't do big business in the States, it was a success to the North, becoming the third highest grossing Canadian film at the time. Upon release, the critical reception to Black Christmas was mixed at best, but over time, as is too often the case, the film's impact was felt and its cult status ensured, particularly when it comes to the slasher subgenre. Released four years before John Carpenter's Halloween, which is frequently incorrectly cited as the progenitor of the slasher film as we know it today, Black Christmas inspired many a film, including Halloween. Today, Black Christmas is deservingly included on lists of the best horror movies of all time. The film has been remade twice, to the quietest of jubilation. If anything, hopefully they lead viewers to check out the original, whose legacy still endures. If you haven't seen Black Christmas yet, tis the season, horror hounds. Also, I'm going to spoil this thing like a carton of month-old eggnog, so consider yourself warned. We open on a decorated sorority house as Silent Night plays over the opening credits before a young woman arrives home. The camera stays outside and switches to this perspective of our supposed antagonist lurking outside with heavy breathing. Black Christmas is a masterwork of the subjective shot, putting us in the demented headspace of a killer. In fact, throughout the film, we never get a clear look at his face. This, of course, adds mystery to malice, but is used to create intrigue in the plot, as we'll discover. The Prowler, who we'll call Billy, scales the lattice. Camera operator Bert Dunk designed a rig that attached the camera to his head for this shot. Billy enters through the attic window before dropping down to the second floor. Downstairs, there's a little get-together going on. Hey, who invited Jean Shallot? The party winds down and the girls send their boyfriends home. Barb, played by Lewis Lane herself, Margot Kidder, finishes talking to her mom and invites some of the girls skiing. Cue the first sinister phone call. Okay. Picked up by our main character, Jess. Hello? played by Olivia Hussey in her fourth role after reaching international stardom in Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet. Hey, quiet! It's him again! The Mona! The housemates gather around the rotary as the creepy voice on the other end goes off. He's expanded his act. Could that be one person? No, Claire, that's the Mormon Tabernacle Choir doing their annual obscene phone call. If you had a Mormon Tabernacle Choir reference on your bingo card, go ahead and fill in that space. <laughs> hey, cat, let me like your pretty piggy cunt. 
Nick Mancuso plays Billy in the film, but it's primarily a vocal performance. Reportedly, director Bob Clark also lent some voices to these obscene calls. We get this great shot taking in the girls' faces listening to the perverse ramblings as Hark the Herald Angel Sing plays in the background, a swell use of contrapuntal music. Their unease is palpable. I'll come over and you, and you can, you can suck it, suck it. Barb has had enough. Listen, you pervert, why don't you go over to Lamb of Kai? They could use a little of this. But it's what the caller says before hanging up that really has an effect on her. I'm going to kill you. She plays it off for her sorority sisters, Fastest tongue in the whisk. who, unlike Barb, are not afraid to appear visibly shaken. I really don't think you should provoke somebody like that, Barb. But you know that town girl was raped a couple of weeks ago. You can't rape a townie. Yikes, who knew Lewis Lane was so savage? Claire, played by Lynn Griffin, goes upstairs to pack, giving us this moment to see just how considerate Jess is. She didn't mean anything. No, really, Jess, it's okay. I have to finish packing anyway. Enter my favorite character in the film, their house mother, Mrs. Mack, played by Marion Waldman. Upstairs, Claire finds the house cat Claude and starts packing. But little does she know, she's not alone. Check out this perspective shot through the plastic. It just feels so voyeuristic and wrong. Sensing someone, she walks toward the closet. Who is it? <laughs> This is unheard over the commotion downstairs. You see, Mrs. Mack has been gifted a nightgown and it's a very big deal. From the landing, we glimpse Billy's shadow as he carries Claire's body away. Some of the most effective moments in Black Christmas are these slow pans and tilts around the house, where the dread seems to seep into the very architecture. Not enough credit is given to cinematographer Reg Morris, who shot several of Bob Clark's films. This shot ends with the attic hatch closing, which means during this slow turn, Billy was circling behind us. This creates such an unsettling feeling. Downstairs, we discover that Mrs. Mack is an alcoholic. <laughs> and the phone rings again. But don't worry, it's just Jess's boyfriend, Peter, a pianist at the local conservatory. Jess has something she needs to tell Peter in person. <laughs> this is really not important to the plot, but I can't get enough Mrs. Mack, who uses liquor as mouthwash. Bob Clark allegedly based this character on his aunt and included moments like this to inject some levity into an otherwise straightforward genre film. Jess checks in on Claire before going to bed. Claire? But she's too wrapped up to answer the door, and we're treated to this creepy nursery rhyme from Billy. Gonna fetch a rabbit skin to wrap his baby in. Eh, he's no Mormon tabernacle choir. The next day, at the campus of University of Toronto, Claire's father, Mr. Harrison, played by Ontario native James Edmond, waits for his daughter. He'll be waiting for the rest of his life. <laughs> Some school children peg him with a snowball. Come on, kids, the dude's daughter was just shrink-wrapped by a demented voice actor. Give him a break. Ho, 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 shit. Gene Shallot is pissed Barb is taking his girlfriend away skiing, and back at the sorority, Mr. Harrison inquires after Claire's whereabouts. I'm very disappointed in this atmosphere. This goes down alongside antics of Mrs. Mack miserably failing to shield Mr. Harrison from the unwholesomeness of the house. Mrs. Mack suggests he check at the fraternity and asks for a ride to the store while he's at it. Before heading out, Mrs. Mack thinks she hears the house cat, who she affectionately calls Claudikins. Is that you, Claudikins? Is that you, Claude? Jesus, Claude, look what you made me do. God damn it, Claude, you little prick. This is very kind of you, Mr. Harrison. Think nothing of it. We watch them leave from the attic window. Check out this reveal. Meanwhile, at the conservatory, Jess drops some big news. I'm pregnant. What? I'm pregnant. <laughs> Jess, that's fantastic. I'm gonna have an abortion. You can't make a decision like that. You haven't even asked me. I just checked Twitter and Peter has been canceled. Also, if actor Kier Dulé looks familiar, you may have seen him in the greatest movie ever made. I've thought this out very carefully and I know what I'm gonna do. Do you know how important this afternoon is to me? 
Man, Peter sucks. Mr. Harrison fills his wife in on the situation, while Barb fills a young boy with booze. That's the Christmas spirit. Hello? Back at the house, Jess answers another call from Billy. Billy! Oh, I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. What your mother and I must know is... Where did you put the baby? Pitsy? You've got the wrong number. That dungeon-esque soundscape you hear is supplied by composer Carl Zittrier, who tied forks, combs, and knives to the strings of a piano to create those hellish reverberations. Where did you put Agnes, Billy? Meanwhile, at the police station, Mr. Harrison, accompanied by Phil and Barb, report Claire missing to Sergeant Nash. Well, what the hell are you planning to do about it? You. Shut up. A humorless fellow with a superiority complex, played by Doug McGrath. I don't know if it's any consolation, but 90% of the time, girls are reported missing from the college. They're at a cabin somewhere with a boyfriend. But that's not much consolation. Because it's required by law for all Canadian films to feature a hockey scene, Jess stops by the rink to ask Claire's boyfriend Chris, played by Art Hendel, if he's seen her. No, not since last night. Back at the police station, a distraught mother reports her 13-year-old daughter Janice is missing, and we get our first scene with Lieutenant Fuller, played by the late great John Saxon, a character actor extraordinaire famous for playing police officers and detectives. Sadly, Saxon passed away this last summer. Nash, you stupid son of a bitch. Chris bursts into the station, giving Sergeant Nash a piece of his mind. I guess that's how real men dress in Canada. His outburst gets Lieutenant Fuller on the case. Meanwhile, at the conservatory, Peter rages his way through a recital. And later takes his anger out on the piano. Yeah, this guy's definitely ready to be a father. And isn't this kind of what the composer did for the soundtrack? Back at the house, Mr. Harrison feels helpless about the situation, and Barb enlightens us on the sex life of turtles. There's a certain species of turtle that can screw for three days without stopping. Three days, 24 hours a day. Boom, boom. Go to bed, Barb. You're drunk. Turns out this is her last defense before opening up. You think it's my fault, don't you? You're drunk. Go to bed. I, I just said that. At the park, Lieutenant Fuller arranges a search party for Claire and Janice. Outside the house, a mysterious figure appears and sits against the tree. Inside the house, Mrs. Mack is having way too good a time given the circumstances. Goodbye, leg, if you get away late. And we finally see where Claude's been hanging out. A taxi arrives for Mrs. Mack, but we know how she gets when she hears her Claudikins. Claude? 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 Where are you? Claude? 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 She climbs up to the attic where Billy waits in the shadows with a crane hook. Claude! 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 God damn it, Claude, I'm gonna have you fixed! Mrs. Mack glimpses Claire's corpse, sealing her own fate. <laughs> Billy watches the cab driver leave without his fare and decides to do some reorganizing in the attic. Don't forget what Maria Kondo taught us, Billy. Ask yourself, does this spark joy? At the park, Janice's corpse is found. We don't see the body, we only see the reaction of those who do, leaving the viewer's imagination to run wild, which in my opinion is even more effective. Jess arrives back at the house just in time to answer another call from Billy. Billy! Billy! Mac! Stop this! She looks around for Mrs. Mack. Mrs. Mack, are you up there? Oh, she's up there all right. And then reports the calls to the police as someone approaches her from the stairs. <gasps> but it's only Peter. Thankfully, this is the only fake out in the film. How did the recital go? How do you think it went? Peter continues to suck. I thought you wanted to talk, so why don't you quit attacking me and we'll try to have a rational adult conversation? And Jess continues to show what a level-headed and mature person she is. Sergeant Nash was on the other line, and when Mr. Harrison and the others catch on, Lieutenant Fuller steps in and finally gives the calls the attention they deserve. Peter tries to commandeer Jess's life. I'm quitting the conservatory and we're getting married. But she stands her ground and shoots him down. Peter, I don't want to marry you. 
Thankfully, he takes it really well. You selfish bitch. You're talking about killing our babies though you were having a wart removed. You're gonna be very sorry. Peter leaves her with that threat just as Lieutenant Fuller and company arrive. Fuller inspects Claire's room while his associate Graham sets up a wiretap, and this vital piece of information is delivered as a throwaway line. Are there any other phones in the house? Uh, yes, the house mother has a number. Yeah, but it's another number and there haven't been any calls in it. Fuller tries to reassure the girls with a cop keeping watch on the house. So you've got nothing to worry about? Yeah, sure. But the police don't even notice Peter outside, who is seeming more and more suspicious. Could he be Billy? A bit later, we get what I consider to be the best scene in the film. Carolers arrive at the house as the killer sneaks into Barb's room. Agnes, it's me, Billy. He calls her Agnes and brandishes a glass unicorn from her table. <laughs> There's this wicked juxtaposition between Billy stabbing Barb to death and the angelic singing that I think really epitomizes black Christmas. Bob Clark came up with that title because of the irony in having these horrific events take place during the holidays. This scene encapsulates that amalgamation. The house receives another call and the police are ready to trace it. Sure enough, it's Billy. <laughs> He even quotes something that Peter said to her earlier that night. Just like having a wart removed. Unfortunately, he hangs up before they can trace the call. Jess discusses the possibility of Peter being the caller with Phil when who should call but Peter. Jess, don't hurt the baby. Stop this, Peter. Again, the call is too short to be traced. Lieutenant Fuller asks Jess about Peter. He was at the house tonight when the first call came. That's right, it couldn't be Peter. Her suspicions seem alleviated, but are yours? Phil goes to check on Barb, and it's the last thing she'll ever do. <laughs> Meanwhile, Lieutenant Fuller discovers Peter's handiwork at the conservatory. He says he doesn't want Jess to kill her baby, but he absolutely murdered that baby grand. Jess locks up the house and gets another call from Billy, and for the first time, we glimpse his end of the call. The bad news is the caller has expanded his act yet again, in which two adults yell at Billy and something about a baby named Agnes. The good news is he stays on the line long enough to trace the call. And... He says the calls are coming from number six, Belmont Street. For Christ's sakes, Nash, you got it wrong. That's where the calls are going into. That's where they're coming from too, sir. You probably saw that coming. The cop stationed at the house has been killed, and it's up to Sergeant Nash to calmly convince Jess to get out of the house. The caller is in the house. The calls are coming from the house. Way to go, Nash. Jess almost becomes the single smartest protagonist in a horror movie, but she blows it too. Phil! Bob! She ventures upstairs, armed with a fire poker, looking for Barb and Phil. She finds them, and Billy finds her. Agnes, it's me, Billy. Creepy AF. Jess slams the door against him and runs downstairs, but can't unlock the front door. As eye-roll-inducing as this seems, the door getting stuck is actually set up earlier in the film. Thank you, dear. You know, we gotta get Mr. Reynolds to fix this door. She manages to secure herself in the basement when Peter shows up outside, reigniting her suspicions. Peter breaks into the basement and finds Jess as the police arrive to her screams. They find Peter, beaten to death in Jess's lap as she regains consciousness. The last scene of the film shows Jess medicated in bed as Lieutenant Fuller talks to a doctor, Chris, and Mr. Harrison, believing that Peter was the killer and that Jess killed him in self-defense. Fuller takes his leave and Mr. Harrison goes into shock and needs to be taken to the hospital, leaving Jess all alone. The camera moves down the hallway, taking in the sorority house turned crime scene as we hear Billy in the attic, and the hatch opens, revealing the undiscovered corpses of Mrs. Mac and Claire. Apparently, Toronto's finest never thought to look up there. We're left where the film began, outside the house. 
the phone rings louder and louder as the credits roll. And that's Black Christmas. Now, your mileage may vary on ambiguous endings. Personally, I dig the sights and sounds we're left with, believing that Billy is still rambling in the attic alongside two rotting corpses, but I feel the aftermath and Jess's fate deserve more closure. Reportedly, Warner Brothers executives wanted Bob Clark to change the ending for the American release. They thought it would be better to have Chris, Claire's boyfriend, appear in front of Jess and say, Agnes, don't tell them what we did, and then kill her. And that's why executives are not screenwriters. Overall, I like how everything is not spelled out in Black Christmas. I don't really need to know or want to know Billy's backstory, something that's explored in the 2006 remake, which was made with Bob Clark's blessing. In the original, what's left unsaid and unseen makes everything that much more chilling. And speaking of chills, I genuinely think this is a creepy film, and that's quite an achievement nearly 50 years later. Much credit belongs to Nick Mancuso's voice work. While the characters are decidedly oblivious so the plot can spin its wheels, and it probably has one too many scenes of little to no circumstance for its own good, Black Christmas remains a classic of the genre and the season. I give Black Christmas four and a half rotary phones out of five. And with that rating, it goes on to the second shelf of the cult rack. And that's my verdict on Black Christmas. Have you seen this film? If so, what do you think? And what other movies would you like to see me bring into the cult house? Let me know in the comments below. I'll see you down there. If you'd like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Subscribe to Cineflect for video essays, film lists, and more. And click that bell next to the subscribe button if you'd like to be notified anytime I upload a new video. For Cineflect, I'm JS Lewis. Until next time, watch something good.